As always, I'd like to thank you guys for coming through today and being part of our, um, our webinar today. And we are already on our episode six, which is centered around communities and MPAs. And it will be presented to us by Nontlem Gadi, who works for the Ezenvelo Kazan and Wildlife. And I'm sure some of you already know who I am, but I will introduce myself again. My name is Dudun Tombela, and I am an MPA Youth Coordinator for Wild Oceans. And I'm sure some of you also know about um, Wild Oceans. But just so you probably didn't know, Wild Ocean is a marine program for Wild Trust, which is a non-profit organization working at a critical interface between environmental conservation and also socio-economic advancement. It has various um, projects that allows it to fulfill its, pro uh, its objectives. And one of them is an MPA expansion project, which aims um, to advance the marine protection in South Africa. So as I've mentioned that I am a youth coordinator, I work very closely with a youth led um, movement, which is called the Youth for MPA, who are actually advocating for more protection of, of our oceans with people's interest at heart. And also whilst doing that, they promote the importance or the benefits that the uh, MPA actually presents to our people and to our economy and everything that um, is important that the MPA provides to South African uh, economy. So it will be very nice if you guys would like to join the group. Uh, at least you know that you are part of something bigger and you are able to play a part in making sure that you conserve our oceans. So if you'd like to know more or even join the group, please notice that on our chat group, which is right, a uh, chat box, sorry, which is right at the bottom, there will be a link that will be put up shortly so you can use that link to join our Youth for MPA. Just leave all those information and I'll keep in touch with you. And it is also quite interesting to know that the reason why we are here today is because of the Youth for MPA, because they felt the need that we need to talk about these topics that, you know, to fight, like have different topics that we would like to talk about so that we understand the platform that we have created as the, as the movement. So it's thanks to them that today we are talking about the MPAs and also the communities. And also, without wasting any time, I'd like to thank Nontle for actually um, allowing, or should I say, for her to be here today and be part of today's um, webinar and accepting our invites to come and do this um, webinar for us, where she will be talking a little bit about the MPAs and also communities. So just to give you a little info on who Nontle is, she is currently employed by Ezenvelo Kezen Wildlife as a social ecology technician and is a master's student in agriculture extension and rural resources management. Nontle believes that there is a need to document, understand and appreciate rural communities that stay within our natural reaches for who they really are and thereafter influ influence effective use of time, strength, skills, and resources available to them. It's been very much top of mind at the moment, especially amongst the youth, with both uh, Jamila's film, which, was, uh, which, was called, which is called Sulega, and also Tembisa's movie, which is called Ulwandle, um, I think it's Ulwandle Lushile. So I'm sure if you've watched 50-50 for the past few uh, weeks, you might have been lucky enough to actually see these uh, movies or films, which are made by very young uh, individuals who happen to be also be part of the Youth for MPA. So as Youth for MPA um, team, we are actually really, really proud that we have such dedicated um, young people. So with that, um, just to, to move on, I'm sure that you guys would like to we do have rules, obviously. So what will happen is that if you are here, it will be nice for you guys to please mute yourself, just to make sure that we don't interrupt our speaker when she's talking. And if you do have any questions or whatsoever um, that you would like to you know, pass on to our presenter, please use the chat box at the bottom where you can type in uh, all your questions. I may, I'm not promising that we'll cover all of them, 
but um, I'll cover as much as we can, depending on time. If I am unable to take all those to our speakers today, please note that we will send those later today to Nontle, and she will answer them, and we'll send it to you by tomorrow. And um, to those who would have loved to be here today, but unfortunately didn't manage, we will be having recordings, and it will be sent to everyone who's here. So without wasting any time, um, Nontle, I hope you are ready, Sissy. So please knock us off uh, with your presentation and over to you. Thank you so much. Uh, let me just share my presentation. Is it showing? Yeah, boy. Okay, great. Um, thank you so much. Thank you for the introduction and um, thank you so much for everyone who's here. Uh, so as I said, my name is Unontle Mgadi. I'm a social ecologist for SMB Law. Um, just like a disclaimer before I start my presentation, I do believe in conservation, but my job is to um, understand communities as one of our stakeholders. So it will come out a lot that I present, I, what I present is not really my, um, my beliefs or my comments, but it's what I've picked up from my research, from my work, um, working with communities. So I've decided to um, name my presentation Profiling Adjacent Communities, because I feel for me, that's where I am. Um, it's no longer about understanding the issues because we know all the issues, the common issues of South Africa that I'm going to uh, tap into, your poverty, your unemployment, your lack of opportunities. So for me, it's important now to just, where there are uh, um, protected areas, marine protected areas or, or inland protected areas, there's a need to, uh, for us to understand more about the communities that are adjacent to those areas and directly do initiative that speak to them. So without wasting time, uh, my presentation, do do, it's not going forward. Okay, here we go, here we go. Okay, so my presentation will include um, these six uh, main topics. We'll just speak broadly about the relationship communities have with ocean, We'll touch on the common use of the ocean by local people. And then we're gonna zoom in to marine protected areas. We now, we, we understand the relationship between marine protected areas and communities. And then I'm, I'm, at the end, I'm just gonna draw uh, my lessons from my engagement with communities around, around protected areas. So um, I actually also grew up in the South Coast. So I'm, I'm, I'm familiar with communities that are adjacent to the ocean. And there's a lot of value that comes with uh, being born in, in an area that, that's close to the ocean. Like it, if there's one famous line that people who are, who, who are adjacent to, to the oceans that they always say is that uh, meaning we have ocean. So there's a sense of, of value that we, 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 we were born in such areas. And it's a very, it's a very male dominated relationship though with the ocean because the guys were, are the ones who are always able to go to the ocean without any supervision of parents. Uh, so I think which also leads to why uh, a, lot of, a, a lot of fishing are fishermen, a lot of fishers rather, are fishermen because even at our young age, it's always the guys who are always able to go. We happen maybe to go when there's special occasion after Christmas, we always, we all going to, to the beach. Um, maybe after, after New Year's, we're going to the beach. So, um, yeah, there's a bit of discrimination that happens there. And then there's, um, from my observation, I've seen that the, the older generation, our grandparents or our grandfathers, are the one, they, very, they were very connected to the ocean more than, more than, we, more than we are, those adjacent to... to, to to, to the ocean because I believe um, in the past uh, there was not much exposure as we have the opportunities that we have right now we are graduates it wasn't something that was common during those areas during those during those times the only thing um, 
that was there was the ocean. So they experienced the ocean. They spent more time in the ocean, which is why I believe they they more rooted into understanding how the ocean works. How do you conserve the ocean? The indigenous knowledge was built by spending more time in the ocean. Well, with the younger generation, it's it's more of like what can we gain? You know, when there's engagement speaking, it's not like a, a connection of this is ours or there is a sense of this is ours but it's like wanting more out of it and not just about conserving it about like what can we gain out of it and a lot of it could be probed by the fact that there's limited opportunities um in areas in in, in areas where uh rural areas where these are these um oceans are adjacent to um yeah so i've covered that so the common the common use of the ocean by, by local communities involve food and um, it's fish. It's, it's a big thing. It's like it, it, it covers like it, 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 it's your protein. Basically, it's like it's important food. So uh, fishing is a very important thing that, that, that provides food for these communities. It's a very spiritual. It's a very spiritual. We have a very spiritual connection with the ocean. And also it serves a lot of cultural purposes, for instance, um, we in in our culture we have is into like izango my your traditional your traditional healers. Um, sometimes I've heard stories that uh, when they train, sometimes they go to the ocean and they stay and they stay under the ocean inside a snake. So and we we sometimes collect water from the ocean to to cleanse ourselves. Or if we want to cleanse ourselves, we go to the ocean. So we have a lot of spiritual connection and cultural cultural uh, connection with the ocean. It's we very in touch with it, and it's something that we value very much. So it's also for medicine med medicinal purposes. We also some people use it. For, for medicinal purposes. There's also in very, very much informal trading. Um, I know that when we drive in KZN in the South Coast um, to Omtualume, when it's uh, in season, you always find people on the road selling your lobsters, selling your fish. So there's a lot of um, informal or illegal trading that's happening uh, around, around communities. Okay, now just to zoom in inside, this is this is your Bible. Like, I don't even feel like I need to um, speak much about it. I'm sure you've seen this over and over again. So basically that the purpose of marine protected areas um, are to be preserved for the benefit of the people and nature. Now, this is where everything starts to be tricky because this is where restrictions come in. This is where there's controlled areas. This is where there's um, permits that I needed. This is where there's management. Now people don't get to do according to how they, they want to do things. They have to be um, regulated. There are rules in place. So um, this is where the big, uh, big moment comes in for local communities. So, um, my 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 talk is very much based around um, my experience in KZN. So if maybe there's other people outside KZN, the the the, the experience might be different. Um, it, communities that are adjacent to uh, marine protected areas are normally just isolated communities where not much is happening around the area, where there's um, it's remoted. For instance, I'm I'm going to refer to Ezembelo. Sometimes Ezembelo. Um, Gets, uh, we get communities coming to strike at Ezembelo gates because they want attention from the government because we the only institutes that's close to them. We are used as a communication line to get the government to respond because of how remote it is. Um, so um, there's a lot of poverty that goes on like, like everywhere in South Africa for that matter. For it, I've, I've, I remember when I was doing my internship like five years ago, when I was doing my interviews with communities around Mtalume, where there's there's an ocean nearby, there was this one there was this one uh, household where I came in and I was doing my interviews and I asked, and the the mother said that they don't even know where the next food is going to come from. So there's a lot of 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 poverty that's that's going on, and you, that's where the link of people not really obeying uh, or 
or, or abide to the law about the regulations that are in place because a person would rather just go fish illegally because they're hungry or they want to sell because they don't know where their next meal is. The ocean becomes an alternative that is there that can help them at that time. Um, there's, there's limited opportunities. As I say, it's isolated. Therefore, it's the market of any like anything that one would wish to do is not there. So it's very these communities are very dependent on 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 survival of natural resources. There's there's gardening a lot. There's there's farming. So everything is like natural, which which how the ocean also comes in. It's, it's a natural asset that they feel like they don't have to pay to go and access it. They don't have to because it's with it's within them and it's 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 natural. No one actually reproduces or it's not like development where someone owns it. So they, there's a sense of it's a natural asset that we should be allowed to go and harvest in it to be able to feed ourselves. So a lot of families or uh, or, or, around, or communities around uh, marine protected areas are reliant on grants, um, on government grants. Uh, you will get like a household of five. Uh, there's not even one person who's working, um, but what's sustaining them is the grant and probably the grant would amount to 800 Rand and that has to sustain people for a whole month. So um, it's, it's been very humbling for me personally to be able to be exposed to, to such matters because um, we really get attached to the reason why people react the way they react, the reason why people sometimes feel like they reject um, by a conservation matters. It, it comes from the experience that they have on a daily that pushes them to sometimes go against any rules or regulations that are in place that are trying to conserve. It's not that maybe they don't understand their importance. I mean, our, our grandparents or any, our community, sorry, I, kept, I, 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 I relate so much to these communities that I end up also including myself as one of them. Um, so that's why you're going to keep hearing me saying our when I, when I speak. So, um, yeah, I even lost my train of my my chain of thought there. But I was oh, I was speaking to the fact that they understand con conserving. They understand. I mean, if people who have been dependent on on natural resources, they would know how everything works. But sometimes we're getting into. I think we are pushed even further to the social issues that they they pressing so much. Also, we have things like climate change, which is affecting um, affecting farming. So, and then, so it's like ocean then sometimes become the main option for them. And then when it's also restricted, it's like another frustration on top of the frustrations that they already have. So um, normally the relationship between communities and, and MPAs are more of like, us and them it's like it's like it's more of like those who are who are managing um the, the the oceans and then and then there's us so there's a bit of 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 division and i believe this division is caused by uh sometimes lack of um engagement or lack of because coming once in a community to consult about a policy is not really engagement that's not really building a relationship there needs to be a constant um engagement on on, on, on everything, on, on the worries of, of communities, on the issues communities have, and the issues that the, the managing um, institute have with the communities. It mustn't be, engagement, engagement mustn't only come when there's issues. Engagement mustn't only come when you want to place certain laws because um, you need to change something. There needs to be constant engagement with communities. Communities are very understanding people, actually, but because it, it for them sometimes it, it it feels like everything is being oppressed on them or is being it's just there's no like how do you guys feel and actually take how they feel even if sometimes you would feel like they're being ridiculous that's exactly what you need to analyze you need to take that ridiculous and make an effort to address it so um yeah there's a lot of division but i don't feel like it's something that can't um be fixed uh, with 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 proper engagement, um, there's a lot of exclusion of indigenous knowledge. I remember in my in my my other slide when I spoke about um, the con marine protected areas that is conserved for nature and um, and the people benefits the nature and the people, but um, 
there's a when you when you say something will benefit me you need to understand in my view what is a benefit uh, you can't impose a benefit on me. So there's a lot of exclusion of indigenous knowledge that has led to, um, to division, to tension, to disconnection, and to thinking that we are not, we, marine protected areas are there just to, to stop people or to stop communities um, from harvesting or from benefiting from the park, which is, which is not the case. And this, I believe, has, has been led from uh, not really, an, wanting to unpack communities before we give uh, regulations and and un as i said unpacking communities is not just one workshop that you go there and you you find thing it's unpacking it's all the time as as we we know we humans we change our minds it's the same thing as communities one day they're going to wake up and their minds has changed so it needs to be adaptive management going forward for you to keep a relationship that will benefit both parties um so it's very important for me for the benefits to be unpacked and for the benefits to be known when how they should come when they should come and and for for both parties to work together because it mustn't be um it mustn't be um all about like science for instance um it could be like a, a, where you allow pe pe people in a certain season to come harvest but you don't know in that season maybe they don't really need to harvest so maybe there's a certain season that they would prefer to harvest in so it's like taking that preference and coming back to do a research as as a on on, on a science level if would it work if we accommodate the season and not the season that we see preferably so because a relationship is not a one-way relationship where a one person always impose oh this is right this is right and the other has to take the other person also has to be heard and then you find you both find be, uh, best ways to accommodate each other um so as I, as I mentioned earlier on, the communities do understand conservation ob uh, uh, objective but the issue comes where I'm hungry, um, and now you've come and you've you've you, you've declared a place that it's a it's it's protected. Even worse when it's re restricted, when there's just no access. Now, what what do you expect me to do? Like, where do you expect me to do? Especially if you come and you just you just protected with no alternative. If if maybe I was relying on it, so yeah, social issues. Um, are becoming a, a big threat uh, for for the conservation um, for the conservation sector. Um, so this slide just includes some of the um, some of the things that have stayed with me over the years when I've I've had engagement with communities along your coastal um, your coastal your coastal line. Um, so I've, I decided that maybe let me just share them. So it, they're in Zulu, obviously, but I'll, I'll, I'll translate them in English. So the first one says, Sifuna hulumeni asini gizikebe na tingoba ukonufishi pagati. So they want the government to give them boats because they believe there's fish inside. Um, and they, that's why maybe it's seen that there's no fish when they harvest offshore. And then Sitisitela Ugunyu Selwa Izibali is a fish, Futisigwa Zutaisa. So they want um, the amount or the, 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 the permission number of, uh, of, of, of fish to increase so that they also want to sell to generate an income. Ka impela se abono to fish we are pela. So this one was speaking about do, that they acknowledge that the fish is declining and that there's a need to protect it. And then this one also, um, I hope no one gets offended by this one, but it says it's the white people that go inside with the boats that finish the fish and it's imposed on us that we are the one finishing the fish. We are Dabugi Isa Uguti Izingane, Zetungege Isa Jabula. Okay, the screen is a bit blocking me on that one. Sorry, let me just try moving it. 
Okay, so ka impela si ya bonu gutu fish uya pela. Okay, I've read that one. Ilezi kepe za belungu, I've read that one. Uya tabugi sa fukuti izingane ze tungege zi jabu lenge mbelo. So this one is speaking to the fact that it's sad that um, our, our, our grandkids will not have, um, will not enjoy, um, they will not enjoy the ocean like we have because maybe of all the restrictions that are coming into place or because of the of the of the impacts that are happening in in, in the ocean abantu balambile yiko si unjonjo fish so this one was speaking about how people are hungry that's why they're going to continue to illegally harvest and uh, uh, because they needed to eat so um so this is my last um slide and it speaks to um what i've what the lessons that i've drawn from the experiences that i've had in interacting with communities and for me i've picked up that uh, uh, the biggest driver to how the conservation um sector and the communities all, always clash and seem not to be moving um in in, in in a straight line together when it makes sense to 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 be that way it's because of the social issues things are really bad in the ground the things are really bad like um the poverty is just out of this world um the unemployment you get graduates sitting at home the frustration is so much and you you and then you get to hear about how precious this ocean that's next to you but it's like it's not like what is it doing for me how is it changing our lives so for me it's very important i know that as a conservation agency it's not our job to be addressing social issues but if they have direct impact it's time that we get in the table and stop expecting or stop waiting for the the the, the, the obvious sector that i meant to be um engaging it's time that we profile we profile communities that are directly um, are directly linked to the areas that your marine protected areas, that your conservation areas that are important, and start engaging with communities in, in trying to address social issues. Uh, because without addressing those issues, if we let them go on, we are bound to just not see eye and eye. We are bound to um, to 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 attract negative um, factors you know and it's not intentionally it's not because people want to destroy it's not because people want to conserve but the, the social issues are so pressing so um with profiling communities i'm 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 in that journey right now for Ezembelo. i'm going around for all our protected areas and profiling them who's there what's there what's missing um why is it missing what can we do uh like just trying to understand each community as positioned um next to our protected areas in this we are trying to see what can we unlock to be able to um to address the social issues for instance the other time i was sitting and i'm thinking we have so many cars at Ezembelo. Why, why don't we let our car wash be from these communities? In that way, we're creating, um, we're creating employment, we're building relationships, we're bringing them in a table for, for everyone to participate. We must move away from detaching ourselves from the social issues because they are our problem. They are our biggest problem. So forming partnerships with with communities as a conservation area shouldn't be something that's that's foreign for us or shouldn't be something that it's outside our mandate um for for as long as things are still going the way that they're going in the country it's important for us to get in the table in addressing social issues so uh, a, a big thing, as I spoke about, it's, it's identifying alternative livelihood options. Another thing is that we shouldn't we shouldn't wait um, for other people to come in these communities and and want to um, and want to implement certain development projects, which will will at the end run also impact um our our conservation areas your 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 mpa so it should it should also um be urged to come from us to to develop and implement alternative livelihoods which will directly and not just like 
your working for water not that i'm taking anything away from it not your 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 project that like i am man to man basis like we need to come with alternative livelihood options that are going to be sustainable that are going to help us build better relationships that are going to demonstrate straight to the benefits that we always speak about when we speak about conservation i feel like you know conservation um sectors or conservation organizations have um great they, they could be great for facilitating the help that's needed um in the communities um so yeah it will be i'm, I'm very much interested in in working with with in trying to uh, come up with alternative livelihood options that uh, profiling communities and alternative livelihood options that 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 is one of my my biggest job i've literally taken a pause um in 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 in, in conservation in conservation matters and now i'm drifting away to like um addressing social issues because i feel like at the end it will have direct impact which is going to be positive in 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 being able to conserve um that was my last slide. I feel like I went on so fast. So but thank you so much uh, for for listening. And I, I hope that I probed some good thinking into this. So thank you. Thanks. Actually, thanks to you, Nontle. In actual fact, yeah, um, I've been listening to you. It just felt like you could just keep talking and talking. And I think what I like about today's um, presentation, what I appreciate more is the fact that you actually do relate to, to, to what you've been working with, the communities that you've been working with. So I do understand when you tend to say we, you know, because for some reason you feel like you are part of the community, you do belong and you do uh, wanna listen to people's problems. And yeah, so thank you so much for this presentation. And without wasting much of the time, we do have some questions here. So far we have about two questions. I'll just take that people are really impressed with your presentation, that we don't really have like 50 questions popping. So I'm going to start with Ruth's question. She says, do you have examples of community engagement that have been successful? What made that engagement work well? Okay, so I've read of them. <laughs> and I believe I will be one of the people who create engagements that are successful in the future. So you will also read about me. So I know in Kenya, okay, so another, I, I'm just going to drift a little bit because I'm relating it in, in, in my work that I do with Ezenvelo. We have a big issue of illegal grazing at Ezenvelo, cattle grazing. So what I've read in Kenya that it took about 500 meetings until they got into an agreement where both the communities have applied themselves and so it takes time it, it this overnight thing that we've been doing in south africa will not work this thing of touch base uh, come when there's funding go that's what's getting us into problem because the communities even now we're having an issue where communities don't trust us it's like oh you're one of them you're also coming to yeah collect and leave there's no we're not going forward and that needs to stop that's where i come in with profiling so once we've profiled we don't need to going back and forward i'll give you information on these communities just do something that's gonna take it take it further instead of going back and asking the same questions hmm. cool and then um i'm just gonna keep reading questions as they come through so the other one actually comes from oh, armstrong and he just said, I would like to know um, what can we do to maintain constant engagement and adaptive management? Um, I think it's what I just spoken about that you, 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 it's, it's, it's engagement all the time. It's, it's, and honestly, it's having interest. It's caring because it's not just, you're not ticking the box. That's that's the other thing you need to connect yourself to these issues you need to connect yourself you need to understand because sometimes it happens that we are too privileged you know to to understand and then we in that way you don't regard people you don't regard people when they speak it's like oh you go there you write your notes you submit your notes and you don't you don't you don't it doesn't you sleep at night 
I've literally sometimes had sleeplessness. I've even written to my boss. I'm like, I need counseling for this job because for me, it's not normal that people can have such beautiful resources, such beautiful marine resources, but yet they're in such poverty. It's known internationally. How are we not creating initiative that benefits community out of this beautiful thing that we stand so proud about? So for me, it's like we haven't applied because sometimes I think maybe we don't care enough or we are too de disattached, but it's, it's caring, it's, it's, um, it's, it's caring. caring compassion. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, wow. Okay. Now, there's another question. I know Armstrong asked another question, but let me just skip to Marisa's question. She said, very thought-provoking presentation, but how do you balance out what the sign points to versus um, what the needs of a community are? Should this not be where government steps in to provide those alternative livelihoods? Yeah, so in my presentation, I did say that because these social economic issues have such direct issues in us, it's time to get in the table. Yes, it's outside of our mandates, you know, even this presentation might be even outside of our mandates, but we can't now sit just because someone else is meant to be doing it. They will catch us on the way. They will wake up with us, whatever it is, like, but we've we've got to start doing something because what's the point of wanting to always protect and conserve if things are going wrong and you know exactly what is going wrong instead of directing your attention to using the same resource that you use to employ more people for protection and the illegal harvesting keep continuing pause direct that funding or whatever resources to alternative life and try something new and see if it won't work because we've been doing the same thing uh, and it seemingly for me, I think it's not working. The protection, people should be owning these places. There should be even be a need to apply regulations. It should, it should be so important to them that they want to conserve it for the next generation to see it. It shouldn't be about now. I have uh, someone looking after it for me because it's, it's, it's ours it's as well. Responsibility. Well, I think that's exactly what we're talking about now because I've got someone, Jabulo, who just asked, what are your thoughts on letting the communities manage their protected areas? Yeah, um, so um, it could work, but also it could go wrong. It could go wrong because if there's um, social economic issues i'm hungry right so we in the community we all just a hungry community we will happen to over harvest if, if um if there's nothing else so this alternative livelihood i think we've seen that well from my perspective it's like um we can't expect um the, the or a certain natural resource that's within the community to be the only um direct uh uh, feed to benefit in the community. It needs to be supported by, by other things that are friendly to it. If there's a marine protected, what other development that are friendly to that marine protected areas that could benefit the community? In that way, you you tell people that this this um, these benefits are coming to the area. Cool. Um, I think, do we take the other question? Because we look like we still do have time. And I guess I haven't seen, like, I'm going to read another one from Ruth. And she said, what are good alternatives, livelihood options that you think, um, that you can think of that would apply or work in South Africa, considering the extreme poverty that we have? Yeah. Um, I think um, it will differ with each place. For instance, this the, the example that I spoke to be about, it's a simple thing. We have, we, as Mbelo has about 100, 110 protected areas. In each of them, we have around 50 cars. Why are those cars not washed in the communities? 
that's an alternative livelihood that has direct um, e employment in the area that has direct economic development. It, it's, it's, you need to sit down with the communities. How, what, what can we do? The smallest things will make such big improvement and will bring people. Because as soon as there's a booming business that is within the community caused by that, that marine protected area or that protected area, people are going to indirectly protect that investment, which is the marine protected area or a protected area in general. So it will differ with each site what they have and what, so that's why when you profile, you know who is in the communities and what are the skills that are in the community. So you develop alternative livelihoods that are fitting for what is in the community. You just don't go around like, um, implementing the same thing everywhere. It needs to speak to who's there and how are they thinking so that you get, it's like a relationship. Sometimes you don't see eye to eye, but if you have a common goal where the goal is to benefit both parts, the nature and the people, you will go forward. Um, yeah, I, I'm sure there are a lot of people with some questions um, or maybe who would still like you to elaborate more. But I think I am very pleased to tell everyone that uh, we, um, in actual fact, the Youth for MPA, not me, the Youth for MPA is organizing another session, which will be much more informal than what has happened today, where they've um, um, suggested a dialogue session, where, which is called Conservation for Ch Conversation for Change, where you'll, we have, we will, they will be inviting expertise on the field of MPAs and who have worked with the communities. And there will be some questions that they will like to impose to them on the day and have a one-on-one -on -one kind of engagement. So, of course, today or like now, we can't really cover everything. And there is just so much that I feel like people would like to know, people would like to ask about. But thank you so much for just giving us the glimpse of, of, of your experience and how you've worked very closely with, this, uh, with these different communities. And all I could feel is the connection and the relationship that you've built, that you've actually sort of like made this your thing, that you even said that you find it even difficult to sleep at night because it's no longer about Nonke, but it's about what those people are going through and you want to make it work for them. Nonke, thank you so much for the lovely work that you do, I must say. And I could, the passion actually oozes out as you take us through your presentation and as you talk us through each and every slide and for even answering those questions. So thank you, thank you, thank you. I can't thank you enough. And uh, whilst, yeah, so whilst we still, um, we, we know that we still have two more webinars to go through. So I'm just gonna quickly remind everyone that on the 8th of October, so please make sure that you do register. We are going to be having Professor Rashid Sumaila from all the way from the University of British um, Columbia. He will be talking on financing MPAs and the links to fisheries, insurance models, and also climate change. Um, yeah, so we hope that you guys will be with us again next week. And we only have two more webinars, so make sure you don't miss those. And Notre, thank you so much. I think we will see you on the 10th of October when you will be part of the panel for our Conservation for Change. And guys, please make sure that you don't miss that one so that you can be able to voice out everything that you, you, you didn't manage to say today. So that will be your opportunity on the 10th of October. Thank you. You're a star, Nutley. Thank you. Thank you.